more time for Michelle Disward. Uh, she's so funny. She's got all of the tea. We're um, scented candle friends, not drugs friends. But, uh, <laughs> it's so amazing to be out here up north seeing you. I really feel so privileged. Thank you for coming. Thank you for trusting each other to come to a live super spreader event like this. <laughs> Really cool. <laughs> now it's really it's really weird, I think, for comedians because we were locked up for 18 months, no jokes, and then they've let us out and they're like, hey, the world's teetering on the edge of dystopia. Everyone's man is dead. Go. <laughs> it's difficult to know what to say. I'll be honest, I briefly considered tweeting something racist so I didn't have to come. <laughs> Michelle's like, don't buy the night where I <laughs> Rattle a few trans cages, lose my house, I could get the year off. <laughs> my life has changed, I've had to rebrand in a pandemic. I know, I used to go out along this nation and empower a generation of young feminists, single moms, anyone who felt like an outsider, I would say, you can do it all by yourself. And then I cashed in those woke chips and married a straight white Tory. <laughs> He's not a Tory, but he's not not a Tory. <laughs> Watch out, ladies, they get to be about 40. I think it's the pandemic, you know? He's downloaded a few right-wing conspiracy podcasts. I know, I walk past his room, I can hear David Icke's voice, I keep it moving. <laughs> and I got married, and I never wanted to do that. I really did it, because married people are terrible ambassadors for themselves. A lot of losers are married. <laughs> Bill Cosby is married. <laughs> Hitler briefly married. <laughs> Pierce Morgan married twice. And I didn't want to get married, but I met my high school boyfriend again after 20 years apart. Oh, I know. Everyone thinks that it's an adorable story. Is it? You didn't have to bang all those losers in between. <laughs> Arguably, neither did I. But I was doing research, Warrington. I was doing research on homeless drummers. <laughs> now, I met Bobby. His name is Bobby, my current husband. And he was... <laughs> He was my first love, and he will always be the second guy I lost my virginity to. Thank you. <laughs> we split up when we were teens, and then we bumped into each other again after 20 years, and everyone thinks it's a cute story, and it kind of reminds me of the scene from the 1939 film adaptation of The Wizard of Oz. You know, at the end of the movie, when Glinda goes, oh, Dorothy, all you had to do to go home was click your heels together three times. Oh no, I couldn't tell you. You had to learn it for yourself. <laughs> I would have punched that bitch in the throat. Like, huh? So you, you mean I was transported from my home in Kansas by a fucking tornado, deposited in Oz, where I had to navigate a field of deadly poppies, fight flying monkeys, and travel around with three pedos. <laughs> You could have told me how to get home, but you chose not to, and you call yourself the good witch. Fuck you. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't want to marry this man, but I love him so much, so we'll have him come to London. But then, of course, I got immigration on my dick about it. <laughs> Where is this going, Catherine? What's your plan? And it was late 2019, and I thought to myself, well, I'll be out of the house a lot. <laughs> I'm planning a big new tour. <laughs> Bobby will be flying back and forth to Canada. I will hardly ever see him. And the universe looked down at me and said, no prick. <laughs> We're going to lock you in a house with this man 24 hours a day, seven days a week, till he starts to lose it. <laughs> and then, as soon as I got married, I couldn't see my friends anymore. I couldn't go to work. I had to cover my face. I'd gone full Taliban overnight. <laughs> Marriage is exactly the way I thought it would be. <laughs> and we've only been married a 
short while, so I love him so much, so far. <laughs> but I know what it's like when you've been together long. Well, people warned me. I was on the bus in London the other day, and a woman said to me, Catherine, I've been married 30 years. The other night, I saw a funny-looking mole on my husband's back. Decided not to tell him. <laughs> Who says there are no female murderers? Who's too smart to get caught with the weapon? <laughs> my husband is better looking than I am. And that is controversial. We have uh, very non-traditional gender roles at home. I go to work, he is retired. I love telling people my husband's retired. Oh, my husband is retired. <laughs> Makes me sound like a young Southern ingenue. You know, I have some 90-year-old rich man at home just wasting away in a wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> my husband is retired. Nope, he is my age and a massive financial liability. <laughs> He just doesn't work. And he's super hot. He's so good looking. Has anyone seen Bobby's Instagram? Yeah. Great, we have the gay community in. Welcome. I feel like that's breaking boundaries because I don't know any other women whose husband is that much hotter. And don't worry, it doesn't hurt my feelings because I'm a trailblazer. And I know he's better looking than me because when I brought Bobby home, everyone who loved me suspected foul play. <laughs> Oh yeah, my sister hired a private detective. My dad made me get a prenup. I was offended. I was like, hang on a second. He's not that much better looking than me. I dated ugly men before. No one was worried about my investments then. My sister Carrie said, Catherine, put it this way. Words can't describe your beauty, but numbers can. Five out of 10, bitch. Thank you. <laughs> This woman says, no, eight. <laughs> Maybe a Warrington eight. <laughs> I'm a Manchester nine and a half. <laughs> no, 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 no. Look at you gals, you're always dolled up in the north. I just have like little limp toddler hair. You have a beautiful headband on. You look so glam. Is there an occasion, ladies? You just out, girls night out. Just out, just me, babe. Oh my God, look at your little short skirts. I can see what you all had for breakfast. I love it. <laughs> Woo! All for me. You can see how I got Bobby K. They love it. Welcome, ladies. Are you all together or are you in like little satellite girl groups? Two, two, two. You guys fucking. <laughs> Didn't you get the memo, babe? You're supposed to come with a gal pal. And you've brought, you've brought a man. Yeah, switch seats. You, sir, out. I thought you were giving me the finger for a minute. No, you were showing me that you are a missus as well. Congratulations. When did you get married? Oh, seven years ago. Seven years ago. Oh, sir, you need to see a dermatologist. <laughs> Don't trust her to flag any funny looking shit. Do you still love him after seven years? Yeah, you do. Oh, that's so nice. And you, sir, what's, what's your name? Steve. Pardon? Steve. Steve? Steve. <laughs> <laughs> is he trying to say Steve or is he Steve? <laughs> I'm a libertarian. Steve? Great. Love it. Steve. But, you know, you're just kicking back tonight. You said, I'll say half the name. <laughs> my name's Steve. My friends call me Steve for short. <laughs> All right. And what's your name, Adam? Stacy. Stacy and Steve. Welcome, them. couple, Stacy and Steve. You really are. I feel like, Stacy, you've just, you've just, you're a bit hotter than he is. <laughs> just a bit, if I had to choose, you know, and that's the way I always see it. I see a beautiful woman, stunning figure, gorgeous hair, luminous skin, radiant. Stacy is hot. 
You can't see her because she's in the front, but how do you think she got to the front? <laughs> and Steve, you're gorgeous too, but you, does it hurt your feelings that I think your wife is like a little bit hotter? Yeah, no, Steve's like good. Hmm? You have eyes. Steve knows. <laughs> good. For me though, it's a bit odd. And Bobby is so pretty, but I mean, I, I, I don't want to make any assumptions about you, Stacy. but in my case, Bobby, it's, it's not that he's not smart. <laughs> it's not that at all. Um, I think we just have cultural differences because Bobby is from the very small Canadian town that I grew up in, uh, but he never left there. And I've been here with you for 15 years. So thank you for having me. But so it's weird though. So when I brought him to London, he could not understand anyone's accent at all. He couldn't understand a London accent. He couldn't understand any regional accents which watch Love Island with subtitles. That is true. <laughs> he would come home agitated. He'd be like, the neighbor Jim yelled at me. I'm like, he didn't yell at you, he's from Belfast. <laughs> He still asks me all the time, oh, what country is he from? I'm like, Leeds, what country is he from? Essex, what country is he from? Bobby can't even say his own name. He has a very thick Canadian accent. He tries to make friends around our neighborhood in North London. He's like, hello, nice to meet you. My name is Bobby. Everyone calls him Barbie. <laughs> He's home all day, so he collects the posts for me, and they'll say, what's your name, mate? And he's like, my name is Bobby. And they give him a ticket, B-A-R-B-I. -E. He's like, why do they do it? <laughs> we had a lot of culture clashes, too, because as some of you might know, for a long time, I lived alone with my wonderful daughter, Violet. She's 12 now. Oh. I'll tell her you said hi. I don't recommend living with a 12-year-old. Nope. It's like having Greta Thunberg in the house. <laughs> I get canceled in my own home minimum three times a day. Oh, no, mommy, you can't do that. You can't play that, mommy. That's not cool. That's not woke, mommy. No, you can't. Violet made me be a vegetarian, and I thought that was a wise choice. I was a vegetarian for about a decade. Bobby comes along, he smokes. When Violet found that out, she thought he was a fucking mercenary soldier. What? <laughs> he smokes! And he brought chorizo in one day. She saw me eating it in the kitchen. She's like, Mommy, why? You're a murderer! I had to tell her, I'm sorry, darling, dick is a gateway meat. <laughs> Well, when I first brought Bobby here, he had never seen halloumi before in his life. He didn't know what basil was. He packed a giant liquid in his carry-on. It was like I was fucking the Little Mermaid. <laughs> Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? <laughs> Where do you keep all the cheese and the meat? <laughs> what do you mean there's no milk? <laughs> What is an aubergine? He didn't know. It was very weird. And then he started falling asleep at 5 p.m. every day. 5 p.m. A man who doesn't have a job <laughs> was tired by dinner time. And I thought, oh my gosh, something's wrong with him. We went to the doctor. He had several tests. He was officially diagnosed with foreign language exhaustion. <laughs> traveled to Japan to study, had to think and listen and communicate in a whole new language. Bobby's dying of this here in English. Everyone speak in English, Barbs. I reunited with Bobby. 
Bobby when I flew back to Canada to film the BBC Ancestry show, Who Do You Think You Are? Do you know it? Yeah, it's a good show. So I was absolutely not looking for a partner. I was not looking to hook up. It's about your family tree. No one's packing condoms for that flight. <laughs> And you don't actually know where you're gonna go when you sign up for that show. All the singers and comedians and actors who do it, we just call it, please don't let me be a Nazi. That's what we call it. <laughs> please, please don't let me be a Nazi. And then we just get on a plane. And all they told me is that I would be starting in Canada. And it was January, so I knew that I would be cold. I was not someone who was ready to bump into her first love. I had grown out my body hair. <laughs> I wanted to be warm in Arctic Canada, so I grew up my arms for about six weeks, my legs, I had like an extra little pair of blonde trousers on. <laughs> I will warn you, once you've lasered, the puss does not come back strong. <laughs> it doesn't. I grew it out as long as I could. All I could kind of manage was a little baby newborn panda, you know, like, <laughs> like a little fuzzy, like, I'm so pink and rare and sleepy, like a little three wispy hairs. Not a good look. <laughs> Not a good look. I hadn't even showered. I got straight off the plane, went to a pub with my sister. Cabin puss, you know what it's called. <laughs> that's cabin puss, yeah. I was just explaining, that's what I was talking about. All right. <laughs> my sister Carrie encouraged me to come to the pub with her for a drink, and you're not meant to let alcoholics drink alone, so I said fine. <laughs> She said, Catherine, we don't know how long you're going to be in town for. Come out, let's have a drink together. And into that pub walked Bobby, my very first love. And I'd had a few drinks with my sister, so I looked at her and I said, watch this, I'm going to bang him for a laugh. <laughs> for a laugh! It wasn't supposed to be anything serious, and that's why everyone loves Canadian girls. What do you do for a laugh? Karaoke, pub quiz, I'll suck your dick at my mom's house. <laughs> For a laugh! <laughs> I have a feeling warranted girls do that too. <laughs> You're not allowed to snitch. You're not allowed to do this. She does. <laughs> she sucks dicks at my mom's house. <laughs> Why are you sucking dicks at her mom's house? <laughs> hmm? What? Your brother? What? <laughs> Madam. Yeah, this is, this is all I'm interested in now. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of a, a, a chic small town. I'm sure we all know your brother. What's his name? Where does he work? <laughs> so the two of you, you're best gal pals, correct? Yes. And you have a brother. Madam, what's your name? Katie, is he younger than you or older, Katie? Yeah. How much younger? <laughs> Two years, fine. Thank God for that. <laughs> Thank God for that. <laughs> I asked her to do the school run, and no. <laughs> and your best friends, your best friends you're, you're called? Heather, Heather and Katie, beautiful girls on a Thursday night out, I love it. Heather, what inspired you to suck her younger brother off? <laughs> oh, wow. So... For those of you who can't hear what's going on here, <laughs> it's a beautiful story, really. <laughs> the Housewives of Cheshire can't compete with this. <laughs> so, in a show of true friendship and sisterhood, Katie has defended Heather and said, she's not the only friend of mine who's sucked off my brother. <laughs> She did it for two reasons. Number one, he's 
really nice person. <laughs> Number two, Pinot Grigio. <laughs> Do you happen to be officially a defense lawyer? Because that is an airtight excuse. <laughs> Your Honor, my client did what she did. It's number one, Pino Grigio, I rest my case. <laughs> How many of your friends have accepted? <laughs> Do you have a photo of him? <laughs> He's just a nice person, I know. <laughs> okay, Warrington Small and his dick is huge. <laughs> yeah. And look at these, there's some like innocent, these ladies want to meet your brother. <laughs> I love that there's some innocent young men directly behind you. I assume neither of these are your brother. No. How old are you? 21 and? 21 year old and they're just listening like, what? <laughs> Why is our gender getting me too'd all the time? Like... <laughs> the real predators seem to be the white women on the white line. <laughs> but Katie, you never worry, right? That all your friends aren't just using you as... <laughs> like a pathway to your brother's dick. And you don't mind? You don't get cross with these women? That's really cool, actually. I think a lot of people, a lot of sisters would be like, all right, tonight, no one nosh off my brother. <laughs> it's my birthday. <laughs> and it's dad's turn. You can sort of the original penis of the household. <laughs> Is your dad fit too? <laughs> your stepdad, yeah. <laughs> I love a stepdad. We're all going to Katie's house after the show. <laughs> it's like in Dream Boys over there. <laughs> This is crazy. What is this place? <laughs> I feel badly. It's not right to objectify men. I feel badly doing that, but I have done it for a long time because I think it's I think it's funny. I think we don't objectify men as a joke enough. Your poor brother. Where is he? He's not a fan of mine, or he's just like a husk of a man somewhere, like laying in the ditch. Oh god, I can't go near Katie or any of my friends. I need to rehydrate. <laughs> Come out with us, brother. No, please, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and he's your only sibling. Thank God. <laughs> Do you fuck his friends? <laughs> you used to. <laughs> Are you the mayor of Warrington? <laughs> person in this whole city. She's a coolest. I'm not that making friends now. I don't know you, but yes. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, Bobby does have three sisters, but they are not my friends. I decided to bring it back to my mom's house, and I really did love him, and it's fine if you just want to, like, have some fun, and that's all it was meant to be, so you watch out, you watch, you watch out. The next dick you suck, it could backfire terribly. <laughs> that could be your husband if you're not careful. I suppose you don't want to give maximum effort. Five out of ten, hopefully you never see him again. I gave it ten out of ten that night. Ten out of ten, Warrington! I'd been drinking, though crucially, I was still sober enough to consent, and I went back to my house. I had to legally put that in. Um, <laughs> I went back to my mom's and I ended up sleeping with Bobby. I, it's not something that I normally do. And in the morning, I was mortified. I just went, oh, what, what did I do? I, ne I never did this. 
And my mom, by the way, wasn't home. Violet was here in the UK. My mom was out of the house. She said, use my house while you're in Canada. And then I crept down to the kitchen to make a cup of coffee. Bobby left for work, because back when I still had a job. And, <laughs> and I sat there just spiraling, thinking, oh, you know that feeling after a night of drinking, like, what did I just do? And then into the kitchen walks that I'd forgotten, um, my mom's husband's brother lives with them. And he had been home all night. Yeah, he is a 50-year-old single computer systems analyst. Exactly the kind of guy who would be listening. And I just thought I couldn't get any lower, but there he was. And the way he was looking at me, I knew he heard everything. And I just thought, oh God, I gotta go film Who Do You Think You Are? I gotta spend seven hours in a library today listening to a historian tell me about how my great, 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 great grandmother died of the measles. Like, what the fuck now is? <laughs> and I couldn't even bear to speak to him, so I just looked at him. Just, I just pierced through him with my eyes, saying, like, you better not tell my mom, Pete. You know, like, <laughs> you better keep this to yourself, Pete. You better not tell my mom what you heard last night. And then he scurried up to work, and I filmed Who Do You Think You Are, and I flew back to the UK. Bobby and I kept in touch. He was always very straightforward, didn't play any games. We were texting, already planning his trip to London. And I was invited on the Jonathan Ross show. Jonathan's a very good friend of mine, so he said, Catherine, what have you been up to lately? I said, well, last week, I sucked off my high school boyfriend at my mom's house for a while. <laughs> Forgetting that they have Wi-Fi in Canada. <laughs> When I lived there, they did not know how to stream British programs. <laughs> but now they do. So the next morning, I got a phone call from my mother. <laughs> she said, Catherine, did you threaten Pete? <laughs> my girls. I said, no, mother, no. I would never threaten Pete. How dare you ask me such a question? Why? Why are you accusing me of having threatened the gentle soul that is Pete? And she said, well, last night I sat down with my husband and Pete to watch the Jonathan Ross show. And I heard you say that you brought back your high school boyfriend, Bobby. So I turned to Pete and I said, Pete, why didn't you say anything? Pete, did you hear anything that night? <laughs> did you see anyone come in? Is she joking, Pete? Did it really happen? Well, why didn't you tell us? Why haven't you mentioned anything all week? Pete! <laughs> Pete! <laughs> said, I tell you, Catherine, Pete just stared straight ahead, sweating. <laughs> So I ask you again, did you threaten Pete? And I said, Mom, I can hear Pete wanking all night. <laughs> He's a pervert, you gotta get him out of your house. <laughs> no, of course not. I would never grasp up Pete. You know why? Pete never grasped up me. That is my dude right there, Pete. That is my man, Pete. Who knew Pete was so cool? Stitches get stitches. Pete knows that. And you know what? We need more Pete in our society today. And this is my message. My, mes my message of friendship, togetherness, unity. We need to be more Pete. You've got the government telling you to snitch on your neighbors, to tell if someone has an extra person in their garden. Oh, I saw Linda's mom went over to the house. See it, say it, sort it. How about see it? Shut the fuck up. What happened to that? <laughs> Are you, it's a bit tense, tense. Yeah. Well, well, it's a town meeting now, I like it. 
The reason I ask is that I think people bottle it up. People don't want to say anything because they don't want to offend someone else. They don't want to be uh, excluded, ostracized from any circles. And I feel like that's very sad because I miss the days when you could ask a question without being criticized, when you could have an opinion without being criticized. That's what comedy is all about. And currently, two of my sisters, thank you one person, currently, my two sisters aren't even speaking over the COVID thing, they really aren't. Um, my one sister, Joanne, she's on the west coast of Canada, and she is very anxious about COVID. Joanne is like triple masked, visor, she's had all the vaccines, the booster. Joanne's over the top, like she would take a vaccine for testicular cancer if you offer. <laughs> It's like, oh my God, COVID's gonna get me, COVID's gonna get me, COVID's gonna get me, God bless the government, God bless the vaccine rollout. I'm like, uh, Joanne, your neighbors are bears. <laughs> <laughs> if anything gets you, it will be rabies. <laughs> but she's entitled to feel that way. She will not speak to my other sister, Carrie. Carrie lives in Toronto, she's the fun one, but she kind of, I mean, she's suspicious. She feels like a group of people might be trying to sneak a chip into her body <laughs> so they can follow her very boring life <laughs> that she uploads to social media for free. <laughs> You're allowed to pee, it's fine. <laughs> and the thing is, I respect Carrie's right to feel that way. I, like, whatever happened to being allowed to make a mistake or to be dumb or to be a conspiracy theorist, I think it's fun. But the problem is, she has breast implants. And I have breast implants. So I can literally confirm there is a serial number written on everyone's breast implants <laughs> all the time. But you never hear a conspiracy theorist glamour model, ever. You never hear that. Oh my god, try and say. <laughs> now I think he's chipped my tits by. <laughs> I'm not joking, Tracy. Bill Gates is single now, I think. I think, no, every time I take my top off, my Microsoft Office updates. <laughs> without being called anti-vax. I'm certainly not anti-vax, though I am anti-vax. It's a drag character that I do on Wednesday nights. Ooh, anti-vax. She's smarter than every virologist on this flat earth, anti-vax. Anti-vax is very active on Facebook and won't put any poison into her body. Anti-vax checks in at Greg's, anti-vax. <laughs> Auntie Vax is anti-abortion, but feels like the mask mandate is a violation of her personal rights. Auntie Vax. First name, Karen. Auntie Vax. Her name is Karen Vax. Um, do we have anyone called Karen in Warrington tonight? She's pissed about it. A rough meme. <laughs> Are you guys familiar with the Karen meme? First of all, yeah. So it's really annoying. It really pisses me off, actually, because the Karen meme is just a new way of making fun of women, of diminishing women, of silencing middle-aged women, and already very marginalized demographic. And this is the thing: jokes about women. Um, we're not allowed to tell them anymore, and that's good but I would love to get back to a place where we could tell them again, because I think a lot of jokes about women are fun, but we abused the power, and now we can only joke about straight white men. <laughs> Steve, you identify as a straight white man. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's the quickest pee of all time. You are not wearing knickers, we know that. <laughs> Steve, do you feel um, like you've, you, you, you get attacked as a straight white man? No, no, you haven't had like a rough couple of months. Do you feel any guilt about being a straight white man? Yeah, though, yeah. Does he? Stacy feels guilty? What, because my husband says this to me, it's really good to have a straight white man in the house so I can study him at close range. 
And he says to me, Catherine, why should I feel guilty for being a straight white man? And I say to him, Bobby, Steve, you don't have to feel guilty for being a straight white man. You just have to acknowledge that maybe you walk through the world differently to some other people. That's all. And it's just that I, I, I hate when I hear that I attack the straight white man because I've told jokes about everyone in my career. Jokes about women, jokes about the gay community, ethnic minorities, uh, trans people, like in, a, in their favorite, uh, disabled people. What do they call themselves now? Celebrities? Yeah, everyone. <laughs> but in an inclusive way where I hope everyone's having fun. But what happened was, when I tell jokes about the straight white men, I get more online threats than that American woman who made tea in the microwave. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> you guys brought anthrax back for her. <laughs> it was a meme, it was like a mommy blogger. She put a mug of, of water in a microwave till it was tepid, brought it out, dunked tea in a few times. I'm like, ta-da! This country went mentally. <laughs> No! That's what happens when I joke about the straight white, Steve. And it hurts my feelings. They call off calm. They're like, oh, lol, that nasty American woman said I was confident on the BBC. <laughs> but I feel like, unfortunately, the straight white man, you just gotta take it on the chin for a while. It's just your turn. That's all. <laughs> It's just your turn, and the future of comedy depends on you. Because if you could just take those jokes and not be such a little testicle about it, <laughs> then the rest of us can achieve a little bit more equality, close the wage gap, stuff like that. And when that happens, we can joke about everyone again. Won't that be fun? <laughs> look over your shoulder and wonder whether you said the wrong thing in a meeting. It'll be fine to say everything again. Steve, do you know any jokes at the expense of women? <laughs> you do? Go on, go on. Tell us one, Steve. <laughs> it's a safe space, exactly. Stacy, does he tell some good jokes at home? Look, everyone's behind you. Come on, Steve. It's this is definitely not a trap. Come on. I said, hang on, hang on, hang on. He's ready. He's ready. Why do women have small feet? Why? So they can reach the thing. Why do women have small feet? Oh, I see. So they can reach the sink, as in like get close to the countertop to reach the sink. Well, no one's feet are preventing them from getting, I don't get it. <laughs> Who's got feet too long to reach the sink? <laughs> All right, Steve, no, Steve. We can't be telling those jokes. We gotta switch it up. How about, how about, how about, life is like a dick. Women make it hard for no reason. Am I right, Steve? Yeah. Whose fault is it? Steve? <laughs> Come on, Steve. Stacy, you can help him out a little. A man, he's driving, a man hits a woman with his car. Whose fault is it? It's the man's. Yes, Steve, yes. What was he doing driving around the kitchen? Wait, whoa, whoa, yes, Steve. <laughs> Feel good to get back into it, Steve. <laughs> but the trouble is, we told too many of those jokes, and the women said, nah, -uh. you were telling a disproportionate amount of jokes at our expense, you can stop that now. And everyone got sad. They said, Oh, well, we really love to tell them the jokes about women. And the woman said, Too bad, no more. And the committee went away and they, they had a little chat and they came out with a new plan. And they said, What about if we just tell jokes about blonde women? <laughs> and the women said, Well, what do you have in mind? <laughs> Said, well, how about something like uh, blonde women are like tiles. Once you lay them, you can walk all over them, eh, Steve? Well, yeah. <laughs> what about a, what do you call a smart blonde, Steve? A golden retriever. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> 
Stacy is definitely blonde. Yes, Steve. No. no, no, no. Blonde jokes are just jokes about women again, but you put the word blonde in front of it. The women sussed this out right away. And they said, no more blonde jokes. And so the committee got sad and they got quiet. And then during the pandemic, that's when they came out with their best trick ever. That's when they came up with it. They said, what about if we just tell jokes, this is very niche, about middle-aged blonde women who have Claire Balding's haircut and complain to the manager. <laughs> and the Karen meme was born. Guys, don't fall for it. It's just jokes about women again. Women didn't work, blonde women didn't work, so now it's Karen, it's just jokes about women again. So they would film like an unsavory woman kicking off in a Walmart refusing to wear a mask. That would go viral, that's Karen. They would film an evil middle-aged white woman, you know, calling the police on a black child's lemonade stand. That's Karen. And somehow, we let that super spread in our society, where the variant now is, I tell my daughter to clean her room and I'm a Karen. <laughs> God, my ear is such a Karen. Why are you really wearing those jeans? God, why are you such a Karen? Who's Karen? Where's the Karen that shouted out in Warrington earlier? Where are you? Across the road at City Hall, changing her name. Karen, are you still in? <laughs> I see one of yours, Steve. Something's up. I won't force you, Karen. I won't. Don't put up with it anymore, Karen. That's all I need to say. So. We took Bobby back to London after that fateful night in Canada. And it was odd because Violet was asking, you know, what, what's he doing here? How, how have you met someone on an ancestry show? I was like, it's not like that. <laughs> what's this man doing? Is he your boyfriend? No, he's not my boyfriend, he's my ex-boyfriend. What? Who's in charge? What's going on? And I said, don't worry about it, we'll figure it out. For now, Bobby is just under review. That's what we called him. I didn't know how to quite explain it. He was like, something we've never had before. I'd never lived with a man before. I just said, Bobby is under review. Either this is gonna work out and he'll be in our lives forever or we'll send him back to Canada, let's see. <laughs> and I had a few things set up in my life. So those of you, I hope no one feels abandoned because uh, I used to be single forever. I meant that when I said those words. You can be single forever. You can be happy and single forever. I meant that. I had things in place in my life to be single. I bought a house in the country because as Violet grows older, I want the kids at mine. I also purchased a German Shepherd police dog puppy because a lot of women can defend themselves and you're really tough, but I am very lazy and I'm usually drunk in the day. <laughs> So if I was gonna live in that country house, I needed a German shepherd in the house. And I'm on tour a lot, I work at night. I leave Violet with a babysitter who is a 20 year old Instagram model. <laughs> German shepherd. And the third thing that I had organized was frozen sperm. Oh, yeah, because if an intruder's not put up by the dog, she's in your eyes, should do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I think you're gonna rob me, bam. You didn't see that dick sickle coming, gotcha. <laughs> You can even shape it into a spear. <laughs> no, no, no. It's because I thought I might want to grow my family. And if you want to do that, you can't be waiting around for someone whose fertility does not fall off a cliff the same time as yours does. The doctors love to use that word. They go, you're 35. Your fertility is falling off a cliff. Which is a violent metaphor. Why can't my fertility just pass out in a sun lounger? <laughs> No, Catherine, hurry, hurry. Your fertility's falling off a cliff like a coyote with dynamite in its teeth. They want you to be really scared, ladies. Just hurry, hurry, find a dick, any dick, and sit on it. Go! Now, now! It's ridiculous. You should not be in a rush. I know friends having babies well into their 40s. Do not let them trick you. They just haven't done any studies on us in about 100 years, right? Um, you seem like... Girls, it's true. You seem like very strapping uh, Warrington gents. 
Are you guys single? No, from Warrington, no. From You're Warrington. not from Warrington? No, no. You've been shipped in. <laughs> because you heard about Katie. <laughs> there she is. She's just brought one friend tonight, I'm afraid. Are you meeting up with the rest of the girls? What are they called? The Hoover Crew? Are you meeting up? <laughs> They're fun girls. I'll be going out with the girls later, actually. I gotta meet that brother. <laughs> where have you where have you come from this evening? Preston. Preston, welcome! Oh my gosh, this is a very international evening. <laughs> Are you single? Yeah. Would you ever consider donating sperm? Yeah. I mean, in, in a medical setting. <laughs> guy and I could do it, I would definitely do it. It's less invasive than donating your eggs. It's a noble thing to do, gentlemen. I hope you consider it. You're helping a family, you're doing a wonderful thing. But I will warn you, the way that they sell it to the customer is very fucking weird. <laughs> I knew I wanted to have sperm in the freezer just in case. And so I went to the clinic and I looked at a catalog. In that catalog, they show a list of donors and their photos next to descriptions. Only the photo is not of the gentleman as he is today. It is a baby picture. <laughs> so right away I'm like, what am I buying? <laughs> And then the description will be like, oh, Roman is a successful barrister. I'm like, who gave this baby a job? He's like, what? <laughs> and then they do a little description what they feel his personality is. So they'll say, oh, you know, Steve always comes in with a friendly smile. And you're like, of course he does. He's about to jerk off for cash. <laughs> It's mostly 21-year-old boys about to be handed money and pornography. Of course, they're smiling. It's very weird. But I chose one donor because he was the simplest one. He just said, I love my mom. I love my brother. I love my skateboard. I thought, that's my donor. Because nobody wants a clever baby up all night planning shit. But then I met Bobby. And I decided to have babies with him instead. Beware when you welcome a straight white man into your home. As I have done, sometimes they multiply. <laughs> I was shocked when my baby turned out to also be a straight white man. <laughs> now Violet has already canceled me for this. Don't worry, she says, Mommy, you don't know that. You don't know that he's straight. It's too soon to tell. <laughs> I can tell he's straight by how he reacts to my tits, actually. <laughs> by throwing up and falling asleep. He hates those tits. <laughs> he hates them. He's called Fred. By the way, my baby, he's five months old. Thank you. For anyone who's thinking about growing their family, I don't want to bring down the mood, but it was not an easy journey. It was not a linear journey, but finally we got there. He's called Fred because I feel like it's a very versatile name, you know? Ooh, Frederick is an electrical engineer, but Big Fred gets his cock out in Malaga. Yeah! He's a kind of man. But he really does hate breasts, and I feel we do his inner monologue like Stewie from Family Guy because he's British. And he's got a lot of problems with me, so he demands that he is fed exclusively breast milk, but he won't actually breastfeed. He wants me to express it into a bottle and then leave. <laughs> so I imagine he's just like, oh no, mother, no, get those rancid tits away from me, please. You will decant that milk into a bottle and give me that as far as plastic, no. Whatever, baby. <laughs> Um, so when we brought Bobby to London, I put some of those things on hold. I put the dog on hold, I put the sperm on hold, and we moved Bobby in. He'll leave less hair on the furniture. <laughs> One weekend, we were burgled, immediately burgled. So Violet wasn't home that night, but we were in the house, Bobby and myself, and the burglar came in through an upstairs window, but I didn't know that. So I was in the kitchen with Bobby, he was making a bolognese, and he had some intuition that told him to go upstairs. He just went, oh, I'm gonna change my shirt, and he went up the stairs. 
And I sat in the kitchen just drinking my wine. And then I heard thumping, banging, crashing, like boom, 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 boom. And I thought, oh, he's just probably chasing the cat around trying to knock the hamster out of her mouth. Standard. <laughs> Standard in my house. And then I heard his voice. Rrr, 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 rrr. And I heard another voice. I'm gonna fucking kill you. And I thought, whoa, the cat's changed. <laughs> So I slowly, with no shoes on, wine in one hand, phone in the other, glided toward my front door. I opened the front door, and I dialed 999 on my phone, but I didn't hit send, I just got the nines ready, you know? And then I waited by the door in case I needed to make a quick exit, and I looked up the stairs for instruction. As I looked up the stairs, Bobby, shirtless, came flying down those stairs. Like, flying down, I've never seen him run that fast in my life. And he played football in Canada, he was fast, he ran so fast and he said, there's someone in the house. And then he ran past me out the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, leaving me with the someone. And he did not look back. I mean, Bobby was gone, just out the door. So I thought, whoa, and I ran out the door. I thought, what kind of killer is up there? And I just ran as fast as I could, trying not to spill my wine. <laughs> I got to the end of the drive, and Bobby had gone right, so strategically, I zagged to the left. I thought, ha, huh, can't kill us both. <laughs> He'd already pissed Bobby off upstairs. I thought, I'll get a head start. I'll go this way. Bobby's fast. I'm clever. I hid in a bush, and I hit send on 999. 999 answered, and they immediately put me on hold. I didn't even know they could do this. So I'm sat in the bush crying, glancing to see if the murderer is coming out to catch me. And they finally come back and they go, hi, 999, what's your emergency? After a minute and 42 seconds. So I launched into the most left-wing rant of my career. I was like, hi, um, I think it's really inappropriate to put someone on hold because you're 999. And I know that you are criminally underfunded and overworked. And I think that's very sad. And I wish they were on my tax money. Hang on. I wish. I went full Karen on their asses. And then I was distracted by a gay lover's quarrel down the road. <laughs> In the middle of the street, I could see a young gay hunk wearing a gimp mask. <laughs> Underneath, another hunk was shirtless. And as I got closer, I was like, Barbie? <laughs> it was a shirtless Bobby wrestling this man in the street. Now, what had happened that I didn't realize at the time is that when Bobby went upstairs, he and the intruder surprised each other. They had a wrestle. He eventually captured him, chucked him out our first floor window, which you're not even allowed to do. You can't even kill a man in your own house, Steve. Did you know that? <laughs> so he threw him out the window and he watched which way he went. And then when he ran out the house, he was running in pursuit of the burglar, not from a killer as I had thought. So when he said, there's someone in the house, he should have said, there was someone in the house. <laughs> English, Barbie, foreign language exhaustion. <laughs> but I don't know what I would have done if it had been me going upstairs, being greeted by a man in a gimp mask pre-pandemic, I don't know. That night, Bobby solidified his position as protector of our family, and he has never regretted hiring that burglar a day since. <laughs> <laughs> really good to One hard night of graft. He never has to work again. <laughs> Maybe he's not so silly after all. <laughs> And um, then when I was expecting Fred, it was tricky. I didn't tell anyone because we'd had some complicated journey to get there. And then when I finally did tell people, everyone said the same thing when I revealed my pregnancy. Everyone went, we knew it, which you're kind of not supposed to say. Didn't we learn that when Philip Schofield came out on this morning? <laughs> If you have a young daughter who's 
brave enough to introduce you to her same-sex partner, you're supposed to be like, great, cool, nice to meet you. You do not wheel out a pre-baked rainbow cake and go, told you, Charles. <laughs> yeah, let people reveal to you their personal information. But it was weird for me because I didn't know that it was gonna go ahead. And then when it finally got to be like time to have the baby, I started thinking about when Violet was born. Violet was born at a completely different time in my life. I was 25, I was very financially insecure. I was not in a good place with her dad. I was very vulnerable. I was in a country where nobody loved me and I had contractions. So I went to the hospital alone. And I said, I'm having a baby now, please. And the midwife, and I love midwives, I wanna be a midwife my next life. She said to me, but, are you midwife? Oh, <laughs> you love me now. I know that, thank you. She said to me, you're not having a baby now. Take a paracetamol and go home. <laughs> I love midwives and I know there's not enough room in the hospitals, but I definitely was having a fucking baby that night. And I ended up having her nearly in a mini cab do you little 21 year old guy, do you even know what a mini cab is? No, you don't. You're too young. It's like an Uber, but without a sat nav, without a steering wheel, without a CRV check. It's just like a, like a random vehicle driven by a criminal. <laughs> yeah, my daughter was nearly born in one of those. What is it with this country and paracetamol, by the way? You guys love, you love paracetamol. Hurt your leg, paracetamol. Your head fell off, paracetamol. <laughs> so I had Violet no drugs in a really chaotic environment. And this time I thought, it's gonna be different. Like you said, I have friends now, people care about me now, I'm established in my career. I thought, there's no need to have a baby like that. And a mini cap this time, I'm gonna have a lovely experience. I'm gonna have a midwife come to my home to deliver my baby. So I announced those plans to the doctor and the doctor said, no. <laughs> he said, you, Catherine, are a geriatric pregnancy. <laughs> said that to my face. <laughs> well, not this face, last year's face. <laughs> he said, so you do not qualify for a home birth. It's too high risk. You have to have a baby in a hospital. And I was so offended. I went, watch this. I'll book in at the finest hospital there is. I'll go to the hospital where Diana had her babies. I'll go to the hospital where Kate Middleton had her babies. I'll go to the hospital where Meghan Markle could have had her babies, but she's controversial, so she didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I went there and I spoke to the consultant who delivered the royal babies. And he said, Catherine, you're old as shit, bitch. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, he was a lovely man. But he said, we shouldn't take any chances. Let's not wait for you to go into labor this time. Let's schedule you in for an induction. That means we know what day the baby will be born. You will arrive in a fancy car in the morning. We will give you drugs to start your labor. I will look after everything on Monday, June 14. And I felt a sense of relief. And I said, thank you. And I paid him one billion British pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and it said, well, will there be drugs? And he said, Catherine, let me introduce you to my colleague, an anesthetist. <laughs> and he opened a menu of drugs. <laughs> a menu of drugs. It was like a sommelier of drugs. They had heroin, meth, everything. <laughs> oh, Michelle, you should have been there. He had a great... <laughs> I said, give it all to me on the day, and I paid that man one billion British pounds. <laughs> and they said, Catherine, let's introduce you to the hospital staff. And the hospital staff were so gorgeous in their little outfits, and they said, Catherine, this is the birthing suite where you and your husband will stay. Yeah, they let your husband stay. And they said, we, on the day, will give you afternoon tea. We will open a bottle of champagne. I'm not joking, and bring you champagne. And I said, that's fantastic, and I paid them one billion British pounds. <laughs> And then I went home to wait for this magical day, Monday, June 14. But on Sunday, <laughs> June fucking 13, I was minding my Canadian business when I felt a terrible pain in my abdomen. And I thought, huh, food poisoning today. 
the day before my baby is to be born. <laughs> In a deep state of denial, I took a pair of cinnamon and went to my room. <laughs> I locked the door, and I don't remember a lot after that, but the family tells me that there was a lot of mooing. <laughs> A lot of crying, a lot of yelling, why, 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 no, no, no. And then Bobby came up to my door, and he came out of the garden, took his little headphones off, and he went to park. Sounds like my wife is in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> so he tapped on the door and he said, oh, hey, babe, I think maybe you're having the baby now. Maybe we should go to the hospital. And I said, I'm not going anywhere with you. All of a sudden, I had standards. No. I said, you're wrong, Bobby. I'm having the baby tomorrow. And he said, OK. <laughs> He's a good husband, isn't he, Stacy? He knows just what to say. OK. If you need me, I'll be digging a hole in the garden. <laughs> And then Violet heard the noises as they intensified, as I was basically crowning. She comes out of her room and she says, Bobby, what's going on? Sounds like my mommy is actually in quite a lot of pain. I think maybe you should do something. Sounds like she might be having a baby. I think something's wrong. And Bobby said, I don't know what you're saying, little girl. Uh... <laughs> you seem like a nice enough kid, but I know. Bobby can understand her accent, and he said to her, No, Violet, your mom says she's having the baby tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but Violet is my one true love. Violet knows me better than anyone else. Violet revealed herself as the leader of her family when she grabbed Bobby by the scruff of the neck and she said, Bobby, handle your missus. <laughs> And he came in and he said, babe, come now. There's an ambulance. The fancy hospital has sent an ambulance. And I said, oh, I will. I will get in the fancy ambulance. <laughs> so with Bobby's help and Violet's help, I made it down the stairs to my drive. And it was just my car, just my car, no ambulance. But by then it was too late. So they hoisted me in horizontally. And Bobby drove at like top speeds in Sunday London traffic to the hospital. It's miles away. I never should have booked in. And we got there. And I got out of the car, and the baby was born. Fred was born nine minutes after I arrived. The consultant wasn't there. The anesthetist wasn't there. I had that baby nearly in a fucking car with no drugs again. <laughs> Crucially, no refunds. <laughs> No, it's Sunday. Nobody has a baby on a Sunday. <laughs> the kitchen's closed, I'm afraid. I lay there thinking, fuck. No wonder Kate Milton's so skinny. <laughs> Probably had her babies on a Sunday. Oh, just like that, I'm Craig David again. To the origin on Monday. Um, Warrington, that is my story. That is my last uh, sort of year and a half, two years of becoming a missus. Give me a cheer if you're Mrs. and you love it. Do you like it? Yeah. Good, good. All right, give me, and this is genderless question, by the way, you know. You could be a Mrs. and, and be a boy. Steve, you didn't cheer. Um, give me a cheer if you're single and you love it. Yeah. I love that. And you're probably thinking, you know, Catherine, what the fuck? Like, you told me that I could be single, that single was the best. And now you went and got a husband. Is it worth it? What's good about it? What's bad about it? I mean... <laughs> What's bad about it is the way out is messy. So I hope, I hope it works. And also, What's good about it is, I mean, I met Bobby because I wasn't looking for him, and that sounds so cliche, but if you just move forward with confidence and self-worth and you live your best life, you will have a great time and you might attract some surprises into your life too. But crucially, 
um, I've learned a lot about fate. And I've tried all the time to make my life go this way or make my life go that way. But at the end of the day, even when Frick was born, I, I tried to do that fancy. And the universe looked down on me and said, no, Frick, uh, <laughs> you're having another baby almost in a cab. <laughs> So I think it's very liberating that we don't really have control over a lot, not at all. So all you can do is your best. And a lot of people also ask me, um, well, what will you tell Violet about men? Like I'm a hypocrite all of a sudden. And I think Madonna answered this question best back in the 90s when someone said, or no, the 2000s actually, because Lourdes was born. They said, what will you tell your teenage daughter Lourdes about men? And Madonna said, if I have raised my daughter with the self-worth that I hope she has, I don't have to tell her anything about men. And I love that answer. That's the best answer. It just took me until I was 35 to have any self-worth at all. Because before then I was dating mm, the kind of dudes blind dogs bark at. <laughs> I love this royal box, by the way. Hi, girls. Pardon? Huh? Oh, you know what it is? They keep laughing after you talk, and I don't hear it. I feel like Bobby now. Are you yelling at me? Yes, I found my way home. Shit. Are you some kind of writer? I should put that in at the end. That's a beautiful, uh, like, little rounded metaphor. First full circle, yes. What's your name? Lila. Lila, welcome. <laughs> Hi. Do we know Lila in the royal box? Do you know Katie's brother? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. She's single and she wants to be single and she said Katie needs to protect her brother, that's all. <laughs> don't worry, I don't think he wants that, if I'm honest. He's <laughs> not like 18. How old is he? <laughs> he's what? Oh, oh, he's 35. <laughs> Leela, don't ruin this 35-year-old absolute gravy train of cocksucking. <laughs> before I go. <laughs> I always ask because I think I've had a lovely like a little 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 little, little lovely little chat with Stacy and Steve and with the girls with Heather and Katie and everyone and that's been lots of fun. Leela's chimed in. I've been very lonely. No one's said anything to me for two years. So secret now when you get COVID. I, everyone's like, we won't, we won't reveal that you had COVID. It's like, why am I embarrassed? Someone gave me COVID. Oh, well, I did everything that I could to protect myself. I always wash my hands. I'm distanced from you guys. I wear the masks. I do all the stuff. I'm kind of in between Carrie and Joanne. But I got it. Um, this is why I ask questions. I, I'm not sure if the tests are as strong as they should be because I had COVID for four days before I tested positive. And I hate that you get called selfish if you ask any questions because like what's more likely someone wants to kill your granddad and take his job at the post office or they ask questions because they've been traumatized by a wolf crying shit weasel government maybe I don't trust them um, and they gave their friends all these testing contracts so one day I woke up and I didn't feel very well, but I didn't have COVID symptoms. I didn't have a fever. I didn't have a cough. I didn't lose taste and smell. I just felt like really wiped out, really tired and a bit off. And I said to my agent, I don't feel that well. 
And she said, well, we're double testing you on this job. PCR test in the morning, PCR test in the afternoon, every day. You're very, very, very safe. So in the morning, I tested negative, and I said, well, I guess I'm fine. And my agent's like, yeah, cash cow, you get up there and talk to this. <laughs> I was like, okay. Tested negative in the afternoon. Day two, tested negative in the morning, negative in the afternoon. Day three, tested negative in the morning, negative in the afternoon. And I wasn't feeling well. I was like, I'm really, really, really tired. My agent's like, whose fault is that? You have a newborn, bitch. Get out of there. No sympathy at all. Finally, day four, I tested negative in the morning, positive in the afternoon, and all hell broke loose. They're like, get Catherine out of here, get her out of here. She might make someone else sick. I was like, what? <laughs> but no one cares about me. It's like, you know how many games I've performed in my career with an infectious disease? <laughs> like, you count on TV, all of that, all of that. <laughs> I just hope that you're all looking after each other, that you're all staying safe and staying mentally well through this time. And I think it's okay to ask questions. I think it's okay to tell jokes, you know, like, how can, how can you trust Matt Hancock to manage the NHS budget when he can't even grab ass convincingly? <laughs> Did you see that shit? They made us watch that CCTV video a hundred times. I'm on the NHS app just logging my symptoms. Nauseous, nauseous, nauseous. <laughs> So, I do apologize if, if everything I've said tonight makes less sense than a Kanye West tweet. <laughs> Having a newborn kind of carries the same symptoms as long COVID, so I'm not really sure. Um, I've loved spending this time with you, Warrington. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much once again to Michelle DeSward and to all the staff at your beautiful theater. We've had such a blast. Thank you. Thank you.